Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And I've had a few requests for today's video topic. I want to look at William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. I want to think about the historical context, the themes within the play, and also, where useful, to look at some excerpts from the text itself. I hope you're going to enjoy. <laughs> Nothing is believed to have been written in around 1598 or 1599 and it would seem that it was performed on or around this date too. The first quarto is published in 1600 and here we are looking at the frontispiece to that first quarto. On it we are told that the play has already been sundry times publicly acted. Before we even open the text and begin to analyse it, the very title itself can be used as a useful jumping off point for debate. How are we supposed to read it, understand it? Is it, quite simply, much ado about nothing? A very large deal being made about a relatively small thing. However, some have suggested that it may have a different meaning, that perhaps it should be pronounced with a different stress. Much ado about no thing. Is this a play on words? A euphemistic address, an innuendo, if you will. In the play, Hero is accused of being unchaste, of losing her virginity, and therefore potentially also her hymen. She no longer has her thing between her legs. Some have suggested that this is what Shakespeare intended with the title. And if he does, then are we to read this as Shakespeare's own moral position? Does he think that the society around him pays too much mind to the sexual behaviour of others? Does he think it ridiculous that so much stress and weight is put on premarital sex. Is he laughing at it? However, there is yet one more way that we could read this title. Some have suggested that for Shakespeare and his contemporaries, the word nothing was pronounced noting. Thus, the play's title would be Much Ado About Noting. It could mean, as it does in the first case, that much is being made out of nothing. However, noting, then as now, may also refer to observing, spying, listing of doorways. And as we will see when we look through the play, much ado is made by noting. People gossip, they listen at doorways, and they overhear. And in the world of the play, that can lead to both humorous and disastrous conclusions. But what about the text that may have inspired Shakespeare as he set about creating his plot and characters for Much Ado About Nothing? Stephen Greenblatt suggests that Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida, which was written, we think, in the mid-1380s, may have been one of the sources for the Beatrice and Benedict characters, these eventually ardent lovers who once mocked the very idea of love itself. The next text I want to discuss have been named as potential sources for Shakespeare by a number of scholars. When they have looked at the narrative of the virtuous lady, in Much Do About Nothing, this is Hero, whose reputation is falsely slandered. They assert that it may have been inspired by a few texts, including Ludovico Aristo's Orlando Furioso, which was first published in 1516, revised in 1521 and in 1532. The English translation of this text did not emerge until 1591 and was produced by Sir John Harrington, Queen Elizabeth I's godson. Orlando Furioso is principally focused on the story of the knight Orlando and his devastating love for the beautiful Angelica. However, the fifth book, or canto of this poem, deals with the story of the falsely accused Ginevra, a Scottish princess. She is being rejected by her lover, Ariodante, due to the lies of the scorned duke, Polinesso. Also suggested as an inspiration for this plot point is Matteo Bandello's novella of 1554. It does not only offer another route for inspiring the hero Claudio marriage plot enacted by Don John, but it may also have inspired the setting of the play in Messina. Some of the other action of the play may have been inspired by Castiglione's The Book of the Courtier from 1528, the English translation being produced in 1561. The Book of the Courtier is a courtesy manual formed of a series of conversations between courtiers on the ideal attributes that should be aspired to by those like them. 
Among other things, the Book of the Courtier makes references to Sprezzatura, which is, as Stephen Greenblatt explains, quote, a cultivated nonchalance. Sprezzatura is a technique for the manipulation of appearance. This masking is an open secret. Others know that you are masking, but they must keep this knowledge suspended in the belief that it is a breach of decorum to acknowledge their own knowledge. Not only does this part of the Book of the Courtier and its explanation give us context for the play acting displayed by characters like Beatrice and Benedict in Much Do About Nothing, it also, I would argue, offers us a broader insight into the seeming minefield of being a courtier in early modern Europe. The question of where and how William Shakespeare was able to access these texts, the possible existence and survival of his library, is a hotly debated topic by Shakespeare scholars and bibliophiles alike. In Much Do About Nothing, William Shakespeare is exploring a number of themes, and I want to focus on just a few of them today. And to do that, I'm going to be picking out key moments from the text that I think best depict these themes. And they include the notion of a person's nature, the idea that somebody's birth and upbringing and status in life can affect who they are and also the deeds they perform. Equally, that that nature might be depicted on the exterior, that the way a person looks, their blushes, can tell you about their true nature. We'll also be looking at the ideas of social grace, keeping up appearances, the notion of honour, if you will. Similarly, deception, and the power of words and language to create and to break apart relationships I believe that throughout Much Do About Nothing, the audience is being shown that words are powerful. They can be used to generate, to create, but equally, in the wrong hands, they can be dangerous, destructive, and even incite violence. At the start of Act 1, Scene 3, we are at Leonardo's house, and we witness a conversation between Don John and his companion Conrad, and they are talking about Don John's temperament, or nature. Don John is the bastard brother of Don Pedro, Prince of Aragon, and in the sections of text I want to look at now, it seems that he is a big believer that the state of someone's birth, the star under which they are born, and perhaps, in his case, the fact that his parents were unmarried, can affect the course of their life. It can alter their nature, perhaps even their humoral balance. It seems that he may be using this as an excuse for his nefarious deeds that have been done before and will be continued after that because he is ill-born, it gives him licence, perhaps, to destroy Hero's reputation and damage the love that Claudio has for her. Don John says to Conrad, I wonder that thou, being as thou sayest thou art, born under Saturn. Someone being born under Saturn refers to them being born when the planet Saturn was in the ascendant. It may make this person Saturnine or melancholic. I wonder that thou, being as thou say thou art, born under Saturn, goest about to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause, and smile at no man's jests. Eat when I have stomach, and wait for no man's leisure. Sleep when I am drowsy, and tend on no man's business. Laugh when I am merry, and claw no man in his humour. All of this sounds potentially quite positive. Don John is saying, I must be what I am. But on the flip side of that, it's almost that he can't control himself. He must eat when he's hungry. He must be satisfied at all times. Every whim must be answered. Just as somebody born under Saturn may be melancholic, it seems that Don John, perhaps because he was born a bastard, must give in to every lust or desire that he has. Don John continues, I had rather be a canker in a hedge. By canker, he is talking about a wild rose in opposition to a cultivated one. With a cultivated rose, you know who the parent strains are. You have, in essence, married them together. His parentage is therefore more confused and questionable. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood, he means disposition, to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage, to feign behaviour, to rob love from any. 
In this, though I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man, it must not be denied, but I am a plain-dealing villain. I am trusted with a muzzle and enfranchised with a clog. Now, when a dog is forced to wear a muzzle for people's safety, this is perhaps not a dog that can be trusted. And to be enfranchised with a clog refers to being free, but shackled at the ankle, perhaps. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am, and seek not to alter me. It would appear then that we are presented with Don John. He is who he is, nefarious, evil and scheming. Get too close, he will bite you. Give him an inch and he will take a mile. If you would like to do a deeper dive on the reasons why people in Shakespeare's time might have believed that the star under which they were born or the fact of their birth may have affected their temperament, nature or humoral medical balance, then might I suggest that you check out my video on the four humours, which I will leave linked in a card. Certainly, it will not be long before Don John proves that his claims to being a plain dealing villain are completely valid. In Act 2, Scene 2, he is shown plotting with Baraccio to create a deceptive scene for Claudio to overhear, so that he will deem Hero, his beloved, to be false. However, in the next scene, a more benign plot that takes a nearly identical form is underway. Don Pedro, Leonardo and Claudio are conspiring to have Benedict overhear different invented tales. These tales are of Beatrice's love for him. Additionally, for Benedict's benefit and overhearing, these three men decide to tug at his sense of honour, insinuating that should he deny Beatrice his love, it would be much to his discredit. Towards the end of Act 2, Scene 3, it becomes clear that their plan has worked. Benedict steps forward from his hiding place where he has been listening in on Don Pedro, Claudio and Leonardo. He says, This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born, so seriously presented. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent, so they are at their full stretch. Love me? Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say too that she will rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detraction and can put them to mending. So he is overjoyed that he has heard people talking of how his reputation may be at risk. Now he can amend his ways and maintain his social standing and the perception of others. They say the lady is fair. Tis a truth. I can bear them witness and virtuous. Tis so. I cannot reprove it. And wise, but for loving me. By my troth, it is no addition to her wit. So loving him does not make her smarter, nor no great argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance to have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have railed so long against marriage. So essentially he is prepared to be mocked roundly for finally agreeing to marry when he has been so long against it. But doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humour? No. The world must be peopled. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Here comes Beatrice. By this day she's a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. Next, in Act 3, Scene 1, Hero and Ursula are shown performing an almost identical ruse, but this time it's for Beatrice's benefit. In it, they also prod at her honour through their deceptive account of Benedict's love for her. And as with Benedict, it would seem that this deception has worked in much the same way for Beatrice. Hero and Ursula 
are also successful in their attempt. At the very end of the scene, Beatrice likewise emerges from her hiding place for eavesdropping. She says, what fire is in mine ears? Presumably this is a reference to the proverb that if a person is being talked about, they will feel their ears burning. Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt farewell, and maiden pride adieu. No glory lives behind the back of such. Essentially, if a person behaves as she has done, people will not speak well of them. And Benedict, love on, I will requite thee, taming my wild heart to thy loving hand. In this, she is referring to the sport of falconry and the need for the falconer to tame the wild bird in their hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall incite thee to bind up our loves in a holy band. For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reporting thee. So she is saying, if you truly love me as they have said you do, and I believe it to be true, then I will love you back and lead you to marry me. Because, as others have said, you deserve that, my love and my hand in marriage. It is interesting that Shakespeare chooses not to stage the other deception, arguably the main deception of the play, the one orchestrated by Don John that intends to damage Hero's reputation and destroy Claudio's love for her. Rather, the audience hears it reported by the people who have perpetrated it. And I do wonder why you think Shakespeare makes this choice. We may not see it in action, but we certainly witness its after effects. We hear it reported that Hero's maid Margaret has been made to answer to her name, and she has been used as the tool to frame Hero as unchaste. She is witnessed or overheard in a compromising situation with Don John's follower, Boraccio. Rather than the good natured coupling of Beatrice and Benedict, this deception results in a gloomier outcome, as we will see in Act 4, Scene 1, what should have been the wedding of Hero and Claudio. In front of friends, family and friar, Claudio publicly shames Hero. He says, Sweet Prince, you learn or teach me noble thankfulness. There, Leonardo, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She's but the sign and semblance of her honour. Behold, how like a maid she blushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth can cunning sin cover itself with all? Comes not that blood, or blush, as modest evidence, to witness, or testify, to simple virtue? Would you not swear, all you that see her, that she were a maid by these exterior shows? But she is none. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. In the first piece of text that we looked at, Don John was talking about how his nature could not be hidden, that he would be what he was and that would be a villain. In this, Claudio is drawing attention to the fact that Hero's outward show belies the truth of her character, that her very nature is deception that what people might take as maidenly blush is, in fact, the guilty sign of a lustful woman. She is, he claims, not what she seems from her outward looks. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. Hero, horrified and mortified by these accusations, collapses. And what happens later in the scene is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most disturbing moments in the entire play. It is the response of her father, Leonardo, to her presumed death. He says, O fate, take not away thy heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shame that may be wished for. In essence, Leonardo would rather see his daughter dead than dishonoured. A few lines later, he continues, Wherefore, why doth not every earthly thing cry shame upon her? Can she here deny the story that is printed in her blood, or blush? Do not live, hero, do not ope thine eyes. For did I think thou wouldst not quickly die? Thought I thy spirits were stronger than thy shames, 
myself would on the rearward of reproaches strike at thy life. So essentially, if I didn't think you were about to die, daughter, then because you have shamed me and yourself, I would kill you. Grieved I, I had but one. Chid I for that at frugal nature's frame. Oh, one too much by thee. Why had I one? Why ever wast thou lovely in my eyes? Why had I not with charitable hand took up a beggar's issue at my gates, who smirched thus and mired with infamy, I might have said, no part of it is mine. The shame derives itself from unknown loins. But mine, and mine I loved, and mine I praised, and mine that I was proud on. Mine so much that I myself was to myself not mine. Valuing of her. Why she? Oh, she is fallen into a pit of ink that the wide sea hath dropped too few to wash her clean again, and salt too little which may season give to her foul, tainted flesh. When I look at this particular section of text, I find it quite difficult to remember that this is supposed to be a comedy, and I wonder what you think of it. Hero, as we will soon find out, has not died of her shame, nor will her father take her life. He is convinced to try another way, and will eventually be convinced of her innocence. Nevertheless, Hero must play dead. She must assume that state so that her reputation can be cleared. I think it's interesting that she herself is not really given any volition in that clearing. She must essentially become a neutral figure, neutralised by her own feigned death so that those around her can redeem her and therefore bring her back to life. Beatrice, meanwhile, will not have her anger so easily sated. Rather, she ends the scene by convincing Benedict to prove his love for her by avenging her cousin's solid reputation. He should do this, she says, by killing, or at least attempting to kill, Claudio. Hero, meanwhile, is forced to become the focus of another deception, a cipher, perhaps, in her own storyline. She must maintain the assumption of her death, caused by shame and grief at her public humiliation. Only this deception will serve to protect her and restore that reputation. Claudio learns that he is duped, and he now becomes the one to bear the shame. He agrees to pronounce Hero's innocence and to marry her, in quotes, cousin. Once he has promised himself to her before Friar Francis and the assembled party, this cousin is unmasked as the living Hero. Despite the fact that Hero has taken part and condoned this late deception, it's interesting that she is no longer deemed dishonest. Rather, by this deception, she is redeemed. I'd love to read your thoughts and discussions regarding this topic, so please do pop them in the comments section underneath the video. Or you can come and find me over on my social media. As always, I'll be leaving links to my Instagram and Twitter in the description box. You can follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel. And while you're there, hit the notification bell next subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now.